All right, moving down to item number 12, discussion items. Butler Fourth Improvements Project, Design Alternatives Discussion. And this is discussion only. Good afternoon, Honorable Mayor, Vice Mayor, and Council Members. My name is Jeremy DeGator. I'm a project manager at Capital Improvements here with the city, and tonight I'm joined by Nick Hall. Good afternoon, Mayor, Council. My name is Nick Hall. I am the project manager for Burgess & Neipel, the consultant firm selected for this project. I have been a professional engineer for five years. I have been a road safety professional for five years. Safety is important to me. We'll be talking about that today, but thank you for having us up this evening. Thank you, Nick. We are truly excited to be here today. I know it's an election night, so we'll do our best to work through this. Uh, there's a lot of information to cover, and we'll do our best to speed through it, um, but we're only gonna really see the tip of the iceberg. We've been working hard for the last 10 plus months as a team. We're excited to be here tonight. So quick overview. Uh, we're just going to introduce this project, talk a little bit about the background, um, <clears throat> excuse me, project goals, then we'll talk about the corridor of the project as a whole, and then we'll kind of dive into the intersections, which have really been driving the large portion of the conversation for this project. We've done a pretty robust uh, public outreach phase. Uh, we've went to multiple commissions, we held a public town hall meeting, and we'll kind of summarize the, the results and the rankings and the feedback that we received during that process. And then we'll kind of just talk through what the next steps are. And really the reason we're here tonight is to seek council direction. We'll have, we'll be presenting a number of alternatives and we have not begun design. So what you're gonna see, everything is very preliminary. It's mostly there conceptual to convey number of lanes or arrangements and so on, but the actual lines are all subject to move when we actually get into design. But we would like to get council direction on what the vision and what this project should look like moving forward so that we can dive full steam into design and proceed forward. While Nick and I are both standing up here tonight, uh, we are just that tip of the iceberg. There has been a large, very active team that's been very very engaged with this process. So certainly staff within capital improvements, transportation, multimodal, sustainability, water services, stormwater, real estate, and others. We've also had our private stakeholders. We've had Mountain Line, we've had ADOT, and we have, we have been coordinating with the commercial properties, primarily on the western side of the project such as the Mobile gas station, Black Barts, and Little America. And of course, as you're aware, many of the developments that have happened have gone through entitlement process along that corridor, so their development has been coordinated with this project. A quick review of what this project looks like or what the extents are, essentially from I-40, Little America, extending to the east along uh, Butler Avenue, stopping short of the Sanawa Heights neighborhood will be widening Butler. And of course, we'll be also be doing improvements at the Harold Ranch Road intersection and along 4th Street, at some point south of Sparrow, continuing down through the Butler intersection, tying into where the Canyon Del Rio development is currently under construction. You may recall this project was actually two projects in the past. It used to be the Butler Avenue widening project and the fourth Butler intersection improvements project. It has been combined, but it boils down to widening the existing two lane roadway section to a four lane road, two lanes, two travel lanes in each direction with a center median um, in those extents just described. The project is funded by both the old transportation tax and the new transportation tax, and a significant uh, portion of developer contributions, as I just mentioned, as they went through that entitlement process in lieu of them going out there building improvements that we would have to tear out in a number of years later, they contributed cash for us to come through and build their final improvements, driveways and frontage improvements, sidewalks across their properties. We won't spend a lot of time talking about the Butler Avenue Harold Ranch Road roundabout today. We'll, we'll show a little bit about that, but that intersection is slated to be a roundabout. This is largely driven by our desire to uh, 
implement some access control along Little America, Black Arts, and so on, um, which would essentially prevent trucks from being able to make left turns out of those parking lots, which would force someone leaving the Little America truck stop to make a right turn headed east. We have to provide them the ability to make a U-turn and get back to the interstate, because that's most of the traffic is going in that direction. So the roundabout accommodates that movement and allows for that access control along that frontage. We spent a lot of time evaluating a lot of the alternatives at the Butler Fourth intersection. We'll dive into that in detail. And this project right now is not in design. We are in that scoping and outreach. So we are out here having both the internal difficult discussions, having the discussions with committees and commissions, and with the public about what this project should look like, making sure that we serve all of our users. As many of you are aware, we have a lot of development that is underway, that has happened, and is upcoming in this area. The big one is shown in the center of the screen. This is Canyon Del Rio, and this is roughly 1,500 housing units, whether it be apartments, uh, townhomes, or single-family homes. That's roughly equivalent to another country club development, so it's quite sizable. This is a bit more dense than country club. There's also a retail component. There's several hundred thousand square feet of retail, roughly equivalent to the Fry Shopping Center on Schweitzer Canyon currently. This is just the general list. We won't go through all of it, as you're aware. This continues to be an ongoing, uh, very active corridor for development. Project goals. When we first started, when we kicked this project off just a little under a year ago, we established what the project goals were, and it really boiled down to improving facilities for all modes and all users along this entire corridor. Certainly, as we work through that process, we have to evaluate our adherence to the regional plan, to the carbon neutrality plan, our active transportation master plan, metro plans, Flagstaff and motion, and of course, zoning code and our engineering standards. At the end of the day, our goal is to achieve the greatest level of safety for all of our users, and this boils down to Vision Zero. You've probably heard this term. We haven't officially adopted a Vision Zero plan, but it boils down to the only acceptable number of deaths is zero. And there is, there's a lot that goes into it, um, but that was a guiding light for us through this process. So just to expand a little bit on Vision Zero and as we're tying it into this project, it sounds like a great slogan that zero deaths are acceptable, and some people think it just as such. But that is the goal, that not one, not two, not five, especially not 6,000 fatalities are acceptable. We need to do all we can to prevent fatalities on our networks. There are many tools to achieve this, many principles to use to get towards this goal, and one of those is the safe systems approach. There's multiple facets of roadway safety that protect users of the corridor, and looking at engineering and maintenance and emergency services, whatever have you. Another piece to the safe systems approach is the assumption that humans will make mistakes, that no one is perfect and not perfect all the time. We need to make a system that allows for mistakes to happen and not cause fatalities or serious injuries. This leads to redundancy in systems. We need redundancy in safety systems to help achieve this goal of zero. Another piece that will be, we'll show later how we're specifically applying this to the project, but a fairly easy concept to use in our designs moving forward towards this goal is separation of time, space, and energy. We've seen this before that vehicles interacting with vehicles, pedestrians with pedestrians, that's usually fine. It's when we have the energy crossing difference, those interacting where we face some of our greatest challenges. And mitigating that issue is one of our easiest steps to promoting safety and really achieving that goal of zero. So this is a typical cross-section for a minor arterial, which both Butler Avenue and 4th Street are. We would typically have our two lanes in each direction, a center median, we'd have an on-street bike lane, curb gutter, that five-foot furnishing strip or parkway that may be landscaped, and then we would have a six-foot sidewalk. Very early on, I know council saw this before we even awarded the design contract, we made the decision to improve upon that cross-section. So in this scenario, we have done a number of things and I'll walk you through. We still have that center median that will be landscaped. Uh, this helps to 
provide visual obstructions and to slow traffic. The lanes, instead of 12 foot wide, which was shown in the previously, these will now be 11 foot wide travel lanes. The on-street bike lane has been removed and been physically separated both horizontally and vertically. So this creates the 22 foot wide kind of travel lane experience. When that bike lane is vacant, it, act, it feels as though it's additional space. We'll have that parkway, so we still have snow storage. We still have that buffer zone for safety and comfort. We will now have 11 foot wide pathways on either side. Five foot will be in a, a directional bike lane and the other six foot will be that sidewalk. This will be on both sides of the street throughout the large majority of the project limits. We are still working on how we will tie into existing um, improvements on all the ends of the project. As we mentioned, this off-street bike lane, this is, we've, we've spent a lot of time talking about separated bike lanes in this community, and we're really excited that we're going to be able to incorporate this feature into this project. We have all different users across the spectrum that are going to use this corridor. We've got people that, that, are, that want to be totally separate, safe, and don't want to be in a stressful environment. And then we've got people in between that have some level of comfort and may be more experienced or comfortable mixing with traffic. And then we have our highly confident users who may be perfectly comfortable riding in a lane in the road. But these facilities do hope to serve all of these users well. I walked through some of those features, narrowing those lanes, some of the landscaping and removing of the bike lane. A lot of this goes to slow speeds along this corridor. So we have already, at, at a minimum, have reduced our design speed. Design speed for an arterial is typically 40 miles an hour. We have agreed to go to 35 for the design speed. It's important to understand we know with higher speeds, outcomes are worse. So that's what this graphic is showing. And this is this, what this graphic is showing is just how fast a car is going when it would impact a pedestrian. When we're in the neighborhood of 20 miles an hour, we have extremely high survivability for a bicyclist or a pedestrian. As we get to those higher speeds, the 40 miles an hour or higher speeds along the corridor, that survivability drops dramatically. And that speaks to the vision zero, so us designing and implementing geometric changes, narrowing of lanes, and so on to help slow speeds along the corridor is extremely important. Okay, with this slide, I wanted to showcase that we will be planning to design two mid-block crossings as part of this project. I'll get into their exact locations in a minute. Uh, they will be featuring the rapid flashing beacon setup that we are seeing commonly around town to alert drivers that a pedestrian or bicyclist or other active transportation member wants to cross the road. We will have those signals over both lanes that that's just having it very apparent to vehicular traffic that someone is wanting to cross at that moment. These signals will be including all of the most recent newest features that would come in with a mid-block crossing or a typical traffic signal. This includes audible and visual locator tones for all users. There's the extended press for the additional audible cue for users that the signals are activated. You may now proceed with caution. Um, this image on the right, though, this is one of the locations for the proposed mid-block crossing. This is on the west end of the project, right about in the area of Little America Sinclair and the overnight truck parking. We have a paired mountain line bus stop just um, to the right off screen. We have the overnight parking. We see a lot of pedestrian traffic through this area. We see a lot of vehicular traffic in this area. This is a great location for having this enhanced crossing, signalizing to a point and having it very visual, visible for drivers that people are trying to cross the road. This graphic here shows the existing FUTS network in the area of the project. You can see for almost the entire area of the project except for fourth that was not yet paved is ride with caution. So not one of the highest levels of uh, comfort, absolutely. This next slide here shows after this project what it will become. This blue here is representative of the buffered path, the kind of 11 foot path, or I'm um, sorry, the five foot directional bike lane with the six foot sidewalk as Jeremy mentioned earlier throughout the limits of this project.
this slide here, we showcase the pedestrian and transit facilities that are both current and planned as part of this project. The bus symbols shown here, the green paired off to the west, that is the existing mountain line paired bus stop. The pair at peak point that is about midway through the project east-west will be a, few, uh, a stop that will, paired stop, sorry, that will be opening, we anticipate, with the completion of this project. At Butler and Forth, there's an additional east-west paired bus stop that will also be planned to be open with the project. I would like to note that the north-south stops are planned for future sometime after the project, but these will all be stops that are planned for this project. The dashed black line you can see in here is representative of the enhanced pedestrian crossings, both the mid blocks as well as at the intersections, which we'll get into a few slides that either it will be a signal or for the roundabouts include those rapid flashing beacon setups for all crossings. Okay, here is a early preliminary design for the west end of the project, looking at the raised median that Jeremy brought up earlier, adding this into the corridor to help restrict some movements in this area. As it was mentioned earlier, we are still working closely and will continue to work closely with Mobile, Little America, Black Barts, to work through the access and safety issues that we see in this area. As Jeremy also mentioned earlier, one of the primary goals for this area is for the semi-trucks leaving the Sinclair fueling station to be forced to make a right turn. That they will need to make a right instead of the left across Butler. They will go down to the roundabout at Harold Ranch, which will be on the next slide, and make a U-turn movement to come back to I-40 if that's their ultimate destination. Quick question, may I uh, just to put a finer point on it, none of these safety features currently exist on Butler, do they? They do not. Council Member Matthews. Just real quick, and I don't know if you'll have it on a future screen, but um, the slide that you showed us with the um, bike lane and the pedestrian lane off um, the road, do you have a map of how much of Butler that's going to, because you had mentioned that there's future issues of acquiring land and pushing things back. Can you show us a map of exactly where that design will go now? So we've had meetings with ADOT. We're still trying to determine how we tie into the on off ramp at I-40, but that will be our western limit. So we're going to carry those, those improvements as far to the west as possible. We have to work, we have to consider right of way, evaluate that, and just consider all the other impacts. But we will have some version of those widened paths that go all the way to, the, to that on off ramp. And then it will tie in to the existing widened section of Butler near the Sanawa Heights. So um, it'll start these off the road bike and ped lanes will start past the off-ramp, past Little America, Sinclair, and go east. Correct. Correct. We still have to evaluate how much space we have there right-of-way wise, and of course the impacts on those adjacent businesses. So we may not have space for that buffer, the, the, um, the parkway, uh, but we will have some form, or it may be a reduced uh, width across there, but we will work with our multimodal planner to come up with the best option to provide enhanced facilities all the way from those limits to the east. And just to add to that too, that for the improvements of the bicycle and pedestrian facilities that will tie into the existing structures um, north of 4th and then also east on Butler to the kind of existing sidewalk on street bike lane, just the uh, part that's to be determined as we move through design and with the timeline of adja adjacent projects is the south end of as 4th is being built out and eventually into the JW Powell corridor where that ties in. But there won't be any gaps along Butler and then um, to heading north as well. While we're stopped, um, so it's anticipated that trucks leaving Little America will have to go right and their next turnaround would be the roundabout at Harold Ranch Road and so that can accommodate these big trucks. Okay. I'll talk in more detail on that on the next slide. Okay, thank you. 
Mayor, I have a quick question. May I? Vice Mayor started it. Go ahead. <laughs> um, and this ties into your comment. So when the trucks have to turn right, will, will there be a, uh, a sign there that informs them that, you know, turn right in, in the quarter mile or whatever it is, you can easily make a left turn in a roundabout or something? Because if they don't know that, they're from out of state, they might go, what do I do now? Yes, there will be significant signage. There are challenges with oversigning projects. We are well familiar with that, but we will have appropriate signage, most likely working with the trucking community to, de to determine exactly what that should be. There will be arrows pointing, all traffic must go right. We will be including that. We will be including signs to I-40. That's uh, fairly common as well. And then at the roundabout two, they'll be wayfinding on the sign that kind of discusses w which leg goes where. It'll say 2I40 for the return movement. Thank you, I appreciate that. Carry on. All right, for the Harold Ranch roundabout, um, I would like to start with discussing about the uh, truck movement. There's a few things that come into it and important to share information. There was a recent law signed into, or state law signed that semi-trucks in Arizona may take both lanes of roundabouts. So it's all encompassing across the state. We were seeing this issue happening regardless of it being allowed by law, but it was passed by law. Sometimes this may cause some concern. We were seeing it happen anyway, and there is a benefit that does come out of it for us with the designs here. By not designing where a semi-truck has to stay in a lane and can go between the lanes and take that full movement, we can actually make the overall roundabout smaller because we don't have to make sure that the truck and trailer stays in a lane. It has more width. We can make the overall size smaller, which does help us with speed management, impacts, et cetera, crossings, everything is benef there's benefit to it. Um, to discuss this uh, geometrically, we do have the four lane corridor moving east-west through the roundabout. There's uh, two lanes for eastbound and westbound. For north and south, there are just single lanes in each direction. It does accommodate the truck U-turn movements. And then for each of these crossings here, um, you can see there's the black kind of symbology there for the signals. It's very typical for engineering design, but this indicates those rapid flashing beacons for every crossing across the legs of this roundabout. So I just wanted to take a quick step back to that law about trucks being able to use the lanes in roundabouts. ADOT is currently working on signage that would be posted at roundabouts to convey that to motorists. Um, as Nick said, it allows us to decrease the size of the roundabout that helps us with speed control. And it also, I, frankly, I think brings law in line with reality that a big truck would take that, that space anyways. So I think it gives us more flexibility from on the design side as well. And just a small note on that, with the public outreach as part of this project, we've been passing that note on to every opportunity we can through the project, the town hall, and various commissions and committees. So that's a high-level overview of what will happen on the corridor of this project, the different treatments, crossings, bus stops, and so on. As we mentioned, we spent a lot of time looking at the Butler Fourth intersection. We're going to spend a fair amount tonight just looking at, we had a lot of in-depth discussions. These were challenging discussions. And I think we considered a lot of different alternatives and we came up, we're excited to present our preferred alternative tonight to you that has been based on both this process and all the out public outreach and feedback that we've received to date. Okay, so, sorry. It's been quite a process as we've kind of alluded to through this that there's been a lot of discussion, pros, cons, how can we evaluate this, what do we need to use? This needs to be multidisciplinary. How do we figure out the best preference to bring to you all tonight? I'm just going to summarize through this slide. There's a lot to it. Basically, we built up to a total of 11 alternatives for the intersection. We were able to take that down to three to have a deep dive review and multidisciplinary review. Even that first cut included various factors of traffic, delay, safety, emissions, but really taking down to the three, we went into the deep dive process of what, first, what do we need to evaluate this by, developing that criteria as a project team, and then actually evaluating these alternatives against it. We did uh, pick a preferred alternative, 
from these three, including the no build, so technically four. We did go through the public outreach uh, phase through the various committees, commissions, and the town hall. And that actually brought us back to having another alternative brought in that you will all see here today that has now become the preferred alternative from the project team. So first to talk on the this slide and the next are not part of the three that made it to the deep dive evaluation, but did want to note that it was brought up numerous times throughout this project and effort of, well, can we make it smaller? Can we make it smaller? And there is definitely pros to that, of course. So to mention on these two that did not make it to the cut of the three, the first one being a five by five signalized intersection. There's a lot of uh, nomenclature you'll see through the next slides describing these alternatives and just briefly to let you know that for the signalized intersections, it basically relates to the number of lanes wide in both directions. So it's approximately five lanes across east-west and then north-south as well for this intersection. Some benefits was it had the smallest footprint. It was the smallest one proposed. That leads to reduced pedestrian and bike crossings because it's the smallest intersection. And with this one and every alternative you'll see tonight, we will no matter what be employing the protected intersection features that will go into detail of how those apply to the signal, signals, excuse me, and the roundabouts. Some drawbacks were the queuing lengths and significant delay that we were seeing level of service, the LOS F for six movements, level of service E for three movements, and an average failing both in the AM and the PM, and ultimately not meeting city, current city standards. Another that did not make it to the cut of three is this two by two roundabout. The nomenclature here relates to the circulating lanes through the roundabout. So again, that east, west, north, south, but you can see it's basically two all the way around, two by two on this. Benefits were reduced pedestrian crossing lengths. It'd be two lanes at a time, overall four, so per side. Reduced likelihood of severe, high severity crashes. This is something that we'll go into more detail coming up, but roundabouts through geometry, not signage, not lighting, force vehicles to slow down. That we can use physical features to make cars go slower and have compliance with that. We can design it down to 15, 20 mile per hour entrance speeds. Having that reduction in high severity crashes is a great benefit. A downside to roundabouts is you see an increase in property damage crashes. So there's a lot more fender benders, side swipes, but people ultimately walk home at the end of the day and less likely to even go to the hospital. Uh, another more drawbacks, again, delays for this uh, setup here. We had level of service F for one movement, E for five of them, and overall average level of service D in the AM and B in the PM, making it unfortunately not meet current city standards. With that, that'll take us to the three alternatives that did make the cut through the initial evaluation. Uh, we'll talk on those. We'll go through the public outreach um, discussion and then bring in that additional alternative that was brought in later. Excuse me one moment. Um, Councilmember Matthews, did you want to ask your question now or was it for later? I can wait till they're done because it's a general question. Okay, thank you. Okay, alternative A was a seven by seven intersection. It is seven lanes wide. And yes, seven lanes is a lot. There's dual left turn lanes in all directions except westbound. We had designated right turn lanes in all directions. It did incorporate the protected features that we'll see in a second. Um, we'll zoom into and talk on them. It did result in a level of service C, which is acceptable by level of service, but resulted in a 102 foot long pedestrian crossing. Next is the six by six intersection. It's important to note that part of this is six lanes, part of it is seven, but not truly active live traffic. So it's still technically six lanes of traffic but you can see on the southbound and westbound legs, there is a additional width just to make sure that the through lanes match up across the intersection. Again, we had the designated right turn lanes uh, for the south and westbound directions, protected features, level of service D on this, in, on this layout, and still that 102 pedestrian crossing because we still have that same width. 
So zooming into the intersection crossing and discussing the protected, sorry, protected intersection features, one of the most important to note, in my opinion, I think on this one, is the curb return or the curve, really, if, if you're making a right-hand turn as a vehicle. Historically, it's been designed of, we can make this bigger and bigger and people can move faster and it's really easy to make a right turn. And that really did not take into consideration, well, what about people trying to cross there or bicyclists as well? So really it has become the standard should be across the nation, but we're utilizing it on this project of reducing that to the absolute smallest size to promote slowing down vehicles making that right turn. The magenta color represents a truck apron that, thank you, Jeremy. This is raised, but still mountable by a semi-truck trailer. It will be very uncomfortable for a car to go over it. They could, but again, extremely uncomfortable and might cause damage. So it really is just for trailing trailers to make that movement and still keep that curve small for regular vehicular traffic. The green also indicates the uh, bicyclist waiting area, kind of a queuing area before crossing again if you're making both crosses. And then uh, the pedestrian crossings here. Alternative C, was a two by two roundabout again. However, now it includes channelized right turns on every leg. So you will see the um, basically three approach lanes. At the roundabout, it is still only two circulating lanes in each direction though. For each crossing, we would be including the rapid flashing beacon arrangement. And again, geometry we can use to slow down cars coming at the crossings, coming into the intersection. We can force vehicles to slow down and again, get compliance. Part of that though, that again too, as a last measure, if absolutely needed, we can even raise the crosswalks because of the slower speeds. We can't do this at a signalized intersection, but with a reduced speed at a roundabout, we can also raise the crosswalks that again, greatly promotes uh, slower speeds. This results in a level of service B and the overall crossing for pedestrians is 104 feet. That is all the way across. We do have less lanes, really five lanes, but it's two lanes. There's a median uh, refuge area, another two lanes, another refuge area, and another lane before getting across a single leg. So zooming into it, um, I previewed you a little bit of the distance crossing, but it's important to note here that the experience of users trying to cross a roundabout and this has been vocalized several times throughout the project and we knew it would be and as a project team we had several voices about crossing roundabouts. Vehicles may not stop or they could not stop. Uh, we will be using the flashing beacons to alert drivers that someone wants to cross. You should be slowing down, stopping and yielding. One benefit we do see though is for a signal, if you push the button, you may be waiting a whole nother cycle or two before you can actually go. We do actually expect and do see quite often a quicker time to cross. You can start crossing sooner once a vehicle yields and you can start making that movement. Another piece that's important to note though is through safety, through the work I do, Jeremy, the team, we've seen this nationally, that it feels a little bit less comfortable crossing a roundabout. It, you don't feel safe and warm and cozy, but we do have red light runners. That is a real issue that typically will lead to a fatality due to speeds for left turns, sometimes rights. This does force vehicles to slow down. A pedestrian or bike is promoted to interact with the vehicle operator. Are they actually slowing down? Okay, I think I can cross. This person's not slowing down, I shouldn't cross. So it feels a little less comfortable, but we do see it as an improved safety and really the outcome being more safe. Historically, roundabouts have been a challenge for some visually impaired people uh, because they can't see, they can't hear, uh, particularly with multi-lane roundabouts. You cannot, it's tough to determine whether or not there's an acceptable gap to be able to cross. That's why signalization is critical to help alert drivers. Um, some of the features, the audible tones and so on to guide uh, those pedestrians as well. And it all comes back to speed, right? We, we spent some time talking about speed as it relates to vehicles and reducing the severity of a vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle crash. But when we're slowing these downs, 
placement of crosswalks is critical. So these are placed not too far from the roundabout, not too close. You don't want, you're trying to pick that sweet spot to where you don't, you have the lowest speeds possible and you're in the position where you are directly in front of the driver and they're not already looking to the left. So crosswalk placement for roundabouts is critical. Done properly and with all these gold standard treatments with flashing lights, we'll evaluate the raised crossings and so on. This can be an extremely safe and inviting crossing for any users. Okay, so we mentioned earlier that we took a multidisciplinary review of these three to ultimately try and find a preferred alternative. We ended up coming up with seven category groups, I'll call them, which each one had multiple, numerous different criteria within them. I'll quickly go through what was kind of included in, in each of these groups and then just kind of walk through our scoring across them. So the first category being vehicular operations. This included level of service and delay. This included VMT and VHT for vehicle miles traveled and vehicle hours traveled. We did look at school circulation and we did look at emissions. Second category of truck circulation. This was primarily focused on how well trucks can navigate through the intersection. Number three, transit accommodation. Similar, but looking at mountain lion and how can we accommodate mountain lion access through this intersection. Currently, and I believe through the future, there is a diverging path that comes through this intersection. So parts of the day, the eastbound buses may go north. They may continue through eastbound. So with that movement, the stop needs to be to the right-hand side of the road. And getting into the through lane is fairly easy. Getting all the way over to a left lane or making that left turn movement, especially the closer you are to an intersection, it becomes more difficult. Number four, this is pedestrian, pedestrian and bike circulation. This was um, looking more so at the pedestrians and bikes and vehicle interaction in this category. Sorry, my notes were not as detailed on this one. So we looked at pedestrian and bike comfort on this and then also um, ADA, Pro Ag, uh, Americans with Disability Act uh, provisions through the project. Number five, predicted crash frequency. We looked at vehicular, pedestrian, and bicycle predictive crashes through the corridor. Uh, again, mentioning on the roundabout that overall we're expecting more crashes per year, but a increase in less lower severity and an overall reduction in those fatal and um, serious injuries. Number six, the pedestrian bike interface. Here we more so looked at crossing distances and refuge islands and aligning with Vision Zero and safety features that there are different interactions and different feels to it. It's not just one's larger than the other, specifically between the signal and the roundabout. Number seven, the ca cost and land impact category. Here we considered construction, right of way, um, maintenance costs, and then construction impacts, both time and to adjacent properties, environmental impacts, and then impacts to the character of the area. So all told, there were left roughly 70 subcategories that you don't see here that are rolled up into these scores. So this was a challenge for us to work through. There's a lot of different things to consider. Some of them are at odds with each other at times. With that, through this exercise, Alternative C did score the highest, as you can see, with the no build option being the lowest. This information we took out to the committees and commissions and the public town hall. Um, this slide here, we show the average ranking by commission and committee. So you can see for the Bicycle Advisory Committee, Pedestrian Advisory, Sustainability, Commission on Inclusion and Adaptive Living, and Transportation Commission, the average votes per each group with a total average at resulting at the bottom. Alt B here, the six by six signalized intersection scored the highest with C being the second place. No build again being last. Diving into these scores a little bit more, this slide here quantifies the number of first, second, third, fourth place votes of all of these uh, committees and commissions. So you can see here that yes, B was the preference, but we did have a close, uh, scoring of C, Alt A and the no build being definitely preferred, or sorry, not preferred, but in last and third place. 
So our final outreach effort was our public meeting, which we held at the Aquaplex back on October 18th. We had well over 100 people in that room. It was well attended. There was robust discussion. We gave a similar presentation and did a uh, extended question and answer. We also opened up a public survey. May, hopefully many, some of you may have seen that. We did get 179 survey responses. Uh, we'll review what some of the, the outcomes of that was. And of course, we've included a link to those responses. In total, counting who attended that meeting and those survey responses, we're estimating roughly 235 residents interacted or provided feedback with this project. On the survey results, one of the primary questions that we asked was asking people to give us their rankings. So people were allowed to rank the preferred alternatives in their preferred ranking. Um, as we can see here, the two by two roundabout, and this included those channelized right turn lanes. It's important to note that's, that's what was presented to the commissions, committees, and the public was, was significantly uh, more preferred across all of the votes received. I think we had 71 in, in support of the two by two roundabout as number one, and 34 in support of the six by six. We also asked a bunch of questions about project priorities. And so we asked people to rank this on a score of one to five or zero to five, with five being very important and zero or one being not important at all. And we can see that safety, bike and ped, environment, and these other ones scored very high. So these were all fell into, these are very important priorities for this project to consider. Uh, frankly, pretty much all of the priorities we had in there, you were able to select, you could have select, scored all of these as fives or all as one. So you could have scored any way that you wanted to. We also asked specifically about some of the bicycle and pedestrian treatments or priorities that we have incorporated into the project. The separated bike lanes were extremely popular. We also asked questions about the protected intersection features, the flashing beacons, raised cr uh, crosswalks. We did ask the question about a separated uh, bike ped tunnel at Butler and Forth. We'll come back to that later. And of course, asked about the mid-block crossings. And again, separated intersection or separated bike lanes, those protected intersections scored very important. And frankly, everything scored as important. We did ask specifically whether you prefer on street or separated bike lanes. And you, as you can see here, we were overwhelmingly strongly preferred separated bike facilities. It is important to note that we did have four and a half percent strongly preferring on street. And I think this is probably reflective of those extremely confident users that, that are perfectly comfortable being out and interacting. There are some complications with the separated um, features here as it relates to how a pedestrian or bicyclist would interact at an intersection. Once you're separated, it's very hard to introduce them back into traffic. So a bicyclist using these separated bike lanes at the intersection would essentially remain as a pedestrian or bicyclist using those crosswalks versus entering the flow of traffic. And then finally, we got all of this feedback, whether it was the commissions, the committees, we had a lot of good discussions. We spent multiple hours with many of these committees. We heard the feedback, the concerns as it related to the size of the intersection, the concerns as it relates to uh, roundabouts, how can we make crossings better for pedestrians and bicyclists. And so we were, while we were doing those presentations, we continued to work on optimizing our roundabout alternative, which was our preferred. And we're pretty excited to present this here today. I'm gonna let Nick kind of talk through the details of what this is, but this is a significant reduction in overall footprint and lineage compared to what it is. I think this, prevent, this presents significant benefits to all users, whether you're on a bike or you're walking on a wheelchair or in a vehicle. So the nomenclature here, you can see this is the two by one and a half roundabout. So it is what it is there. Basically, we have two lanes circulating east-west, and then two for northbound, one for southbound. So that's where that nomenclature kind of came from. The circulating lanes within the roundabout, we've reduced one lane in one of those legs. The 
outer legs approaching and both leaving the roundabout, we were able to reduce six lanes from the alternative C that you saw earlier. You can see that in each direction we have four lanes approaching in, in two directions and three in the other, or sorry, on each leg. So overall smaller footprint, less crossing distance for pedestrians and bikes. We will still include the rapid flashing beacons with all crossings here. It's a little hard to see in the detail on this slide, but there will be currently planned, and there will be a question later on this too, of including refuge islands between the through lanes as well. So there is potential to have a lot of single lane crossings. You can see here that only three of the legs actually have pedestrians and bicyclists crossing two lanes at a time. The rest are all single lane crossings. We'll still be evaluating the raised crosswalks, and this did result in a level service C and with a 86 foot uh, pedestrian crossing from one corner to the next. So this is coming back to the scoring matrix you saw earlier. We now have the new column added for this alternative D. The scores are off to the right. Again, this we saw more of a balance between the vehicular and the active transportation users that we're seeing the slower speeds, we're seeing smaller, um, sorry, reduced crossing lengths. We get all the benefits and still have a smaller intersection. So as Jeremy mentioned, we are excited to present this one here today. It is important to note that this came after our outreach with all the committees, commissions, and the town hall from the input that we received from them to get to this point. So this was not presented to the committees and commissions for alternative D. Another piece to note that you may have seen in this uh, coming up to the point is that for a few of the categories for alternative C, it did receive more points when we went back through and scored this, act, scored this again. And that was just through the project team learning more and understanding about the benefits of roundabouts and that they can have significant benefits for pedestrians and bikes as well. So we're here, I'm just gonna briefly talk about what happens after tonight. We're here tonight asking for direction and we'll, we'll get into the details of what specifically we're asking for. If we get direction tonight, we will proceed into design. We will be back in front of council at several points in the future. We will be back to process a contract modification. We did this in a phased approach. So we did a phase A with Burgess and Nightbull and we will be back to uh, extend their contract to take us through final design. We will also be delivering this project through the construction manager at risk, the delivery process, so the CMAR. So we will be back sometime this winter to bring that contractor on board for the design phase services. And, um, and we'll continue to work with uh, Burgess and Nightbull. If, if we're able to continue and dive strictly into design, we may be able to get shovels in the ground in late 2024. There are some advantages to CMAR to where you could potentially phase and get started on some of the, some of the underground work while you're still finalizing some of the, the surface improvements. So real quick, what we're here tonight, what we're asking from council is for direction moving forward. Typically, you would have seen this project much further along. We would have actually been in design. It's important to note we haven't done design. And so now is the time for us to make high level framework level dis decisions that would help guide us in design and so on. So the first question is we've presented our recommended alternative, which is this we're calling optimized roundabout. We would like to have guidance on whether that, that continues to be uh, council's direction as well. Should the roundabout option be selected, we do have some roundabout specific um, questions that we'd like to also get guidance on. So to discuss these very quickly, that as mentioned earlier with the additional refuge islands, we can add in the roundabout, kind of splitting up the lanes and having more crossings but fewer lanes each time. That is a possibility. However, it does increase the overall crossing distance by adding additional curb in there that the lanes do have to become wider to accommodate the trucks. So you'll cross less lanes at a time, but overall the crossing will increase. And we've seen that as a trade-off and that was voiced to us that it, do, it matters both, that the individual crossings and the total amount of space I need to travel to get across, that was voiced to us many times. So we're here to ask for guidance on that. Um, and, oh yeah, sorry, that was the second bullet under roundabout, my apologies. The first bullet relates to, in the upper right of this screen, there's two configurations for 
crossing the legs of a roundabout. And they both have their pros and cons, and we've heard support and lack of support for both, I would say. But one, as part of protected roundabouts, it's been shown for more of a direct path, kind of minimizing that overall distance. And it was told to us from bicycle users that this is preferable, that I can get quicker across, that it's a straight shot for me, it's easier. But then if we look at the offset crossing, that kind of top right, this has additional safety features for allowing cars to queue behind or in front. It uh, makes it a safer spot for pedestrians to cross. So there are, both would be fine, but we see a, between the pedestrian and bicycle worlds, there's more of a lean one way or the other. Can I ask you to clarify what you just said about cars queuing behind? Yeah, yeah sorry, I may have gone a little too fast over that with not enough detail. So in the, if we look at that upper right image and look at the approach, oh, yeah, sorry, that would help. If we look at the approaching lanes to the roundabout, there is that yield condition before the crosswalk, which we use all across town, that's important but there is space behind the crosswalk for a single vehicle to get beyond the crosswalk and now focus on vehicles and that interaction to move on. So they're not jumping from the crosswalk and trying to judge jumping into vehicular traffic too far back. So it's kind of a two stage if there's pedestrians and vehicles present. Um, and on the left, what would that look like? So it's the main difference for pedestrians There'd still be that 20 foot behind, um, the storage, we would still have that, but it's really keeping the, the main difference between these two is keeping the proximity to the intersection. So from the top right, that's the, we can take it all the way up to 20 feet away. On the left side, it's actually further back, so overall your crossing to get from one side to the other of the intersection would be longer. It's stretched out, the crossings are further away as well, so that's, that's the, so the straight crossings don't provide quite as much flexibility to get the optimal placement for those crosswalks relation to the geometry of the roundabout, whereas the Zs allow you to kind of reorient and get those crosswalks in the optimal location to the roundabout. In both instances, you're going to get these in a good spot, but the, the one is just a little more flexible than the other. So we will come back and dive into that should the roundabout move forward. We can talk through the details of what that is. One of the other questions is just the great separated pedestrian crossing at Butler and Forth. The, the graphic in the lower right corner there, there is, we are going to be rerouting that Spruce Avenue wash portion through this intersection. The whole, we didn't speak about it, but that intersection will be raised six to seven feet, bringing it up out of, so it will not flood during high flow um, events. So there will be a diagonal storm drain crossing through there. Um, there are opportunities to either have a combined facility or a separate but adjacent facility that would parallel that storm drain that would allow you to kind of cut through that corner in a separated manner. While this doesn't really support like general pedestrians that are necessarily going from Sanawa to Little America or so on, it does support, it does align well with the Foots network. So we have that Foots trail that comes down the west side of 4th Street that crosses and goes down south of Butler. Um, and of course there are plans for um, Foots trail to continue to the west towards the bluffs before it turns off into that wash. So that will be one of the considerations. We'll provide more information. Roughly, we're currently estimating that's about a $2 million ad to include that. Separated crossings are not cheap, as you know. So at this point, at the end of the day, we're really trying to get an alternative that we can advance into design so that we can really dive in, do the good work, come back, share the updates, provide another opportunity to help refine and guide the project and then allow us to proceed towards final design and construction. So this concludes our presentation at this point. We're obviously here to answer any questions and we will, we look forward to, to that. Thank you. All right, first up we have Council Member Matthews. Thank you, Mayor. Um, just for clarification purposes, um, early in the presentation, you talked about different speed limits. Is Butler an eight-out road, or is it 
Flagstaff Road? I mean, who, who determines the speed limit? Butler is a Flagstaff Road. ADOT right-of-way ends roughly at the on-off ramps there at that signal. Okay. Because um, what I was thinking when you were showing me, of course, you know, more uh, fatalities, the faster we go, right? Um, I'm not as concerned about it if we do have separated bike and ped paths. That would help. But I keep thinking about all those houses being built on Butler and... You know, I'm thinking, um, you know, people trying to punch it <laughs> to get on the road if the speed limit is too high. And so I'm just kind of saying that out loud to say I just have some, a little bit of discomfort. I know that if it's too slow, people just won't um, yield to it. But I want to be very, um, very sensitive to our bike and, and ped uh, population because um, all of these conversations really I think we we all talk about that being a top priority what I don't like what you're presenting today I like but what I don't like is is us having uh, give you direction and then you spend a few hundred thousand dollars on it and then a new council comes and says no I want to do it this other way so I hope that whatever direction we give you is one that we'll stick with because um, I, I saw another project before I got on council where there was a totally redirect, and it was very expensive. Um, and I want to be sensitive to taxpayer money. So, um, and I'm also, you know, anxious for JW Pal connection to to help relieve that. So, um, I like the tabletop crosswalks added. Speaking of spending money, but first time around, um, and I do like this last. Um, option um, um, in, in, in helping because I, when you were showing us the graph I didn't like option uh, the one before you got to D uh, because it minimized um, the bike and ped safety um, so I was kind of swaying towards option C until you got to or option B until you got to D so I'm in favor of D um, and I'm in favor of the, the flashing lights and the separated bike and ped lanes. I really want to see that happening. I think we should have it all the way on Butler. Um, and I know there's some challenges there when you get more into town, but um, those are just my comments on that. So I think, oh, and was there, because this roundabout is right off Harold Ranch Road, right? And so what's the north road? So I'm thinking Butler, east and west, so south I think is I, Harold. I think I failed to mention that, that Harold will be realigned slightly, the north end portion of it, to come up to this roundabout. So the center of the roundabout will be approximately located at the east property edge of Black Bart's. So it's a few hundred feet down the road. There'll be a north exit that could be used by Black Bart's if they choose to in the future, but also for the development in that upper uh, right corner there can access that uh, northern portion. So it'll be realigned a little bit further down the road. That so that sense. north leg will be the driveway to the Butler Lofts project. Perfect. Okay. Thank you. That's all I have. Council Member McCarthy. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I have some comments regarding the uh, intersection at 4th Street. Um, First of all, I'll say that the seven by seven or six by six uh, intersections are completely off out of the question in my mind. Why would I say that? Because for a bicyclist or pedestrian to go across six lanes of traffic is just ridiculous. Um, but now, now, see, but people say, well, it's even farther for the roundabout. Well, there's a big difference. The big difference is that they only have to cross like two lanes at a time. And then there's a refuge area where they can stop. So they really only have to negotiate two lanes at a time, not six lanes at a time. So um, I think that we need to increase the widths of the refuge areas, because I think those are a very important part of the uh, roundabout design. So that, you 
know, a bicycle can stand there and, you know, its front tire isn't being hit by one lane of traffic and the back tire isn't being threatened by another lane of traffic. So it needs to be uh, enough room, you know, like, I don't know what the number would be, like eight feet or something, not like one foot. That's inadequate. Um, we also need to have where a pedestrian or bike is trying to cross two lanes, there needs to be a sign of telling people that watch, there's two traffic lanes. You make sure that they're both stopped before you walked out. I'll just really tell you a story. Mm -hmm. The woman, the girl that lived across the street from me when I was raising, being raised, she walked across the street where a car had stopped. But the second Second lane, the car didn't stop, and she got hit, and she is now dead. So we need signs saying, be careful, two lanes ahead. So the refuge areas, very important. They need to be increased. So I support uh, um, either alternative C, two by two, or the D, two by one and a half. I think I can live with either one of those. Uh, I do th think it's a good to have grade separation. And we definitely should look into a, a below-grade pedestrian tunnel. Um, if that's at all practical, uh, we should do that. Um, and I like the offset crossing, like the, the, the slide that's on the screen right now, the very upper right-hand corner. Why do I like that? It's not as good for bicycles, but it's, it's, a, it's good for somebody that's even more vulnerable, and that's true talked about this when we, we talked about the roundabout for 4th Street up north um, because we're concerned that the kids will just run right across. So the two lanes of traffic stopped, but they just run across and think the other ones are going to stop. Well, if there's a little bit of an offset, there a Z or I guess what we're calling an offset cross, I think it, it makes people stop and think and go, oh, there's traffic coming here, too. I have to be really careful. So that's kind of, uh, I think I covered all your questions. But I'll leave it at that. Right. Thank you. Council Member Sweet. Thank you. A couple of questions. Um, I, well, I guess first off, thank you for listening to the community and coming up with some alternatives to the designs and I really appreciate the time and effort you put into this. I am wondering how you came up with the 35 mile per hour speed limit and how does that correlate when you go into the roundabout? If you're going that speed, how are we slowing them down to get into the roundabout? Speed limit is largely dictated by engineering standards for arterial roads. Um, we, it would generally be 40, so we have reduced it by five. Um, again, I think Councilmember Matthews spoke to some of this, you know, as far as speed, speed is a challenge. At some point, once we get down into the lower speeds, 30 and less, the geometry becomes less and less impactful. Um, certainly a big wide road is going to encourage high speeds, which we have not built here. We've been very conscious to, to narrow this up and keep this feeling like you want to drive slower. And it does get to that point of, you know, at some point it just becomes a number on a sign. Um, of course, I think there's probably a much more um, engaged uh, conversation around speed limits that will likely need to take place uh, as we move forward. So to add on the first response and then uh, address the second, one benefit that was not mentioned earlier that if it is a paired roundabout system in this corridor and not a signal that if you potentially get a green and can come down the hill at 40, 45 heading towards the interstate, we will see slower speeds just in that corridor between the intersections if there's two roundabouts due to the slowing down at the roundabouts. Now discussing how we achieve that, I. I think I would assume it's been used here, but a lot of times in industry we now say modern roundabouts, and it's like, well, it's the old roundabouts. But um, there's been, again, through engineering iteration, what can we do better, what can we do better, that a few f aspects to roundabout design is for this roundabout, and especially high-speed roundabouts when you get onto state highways, when you see them coming up in 
Camp Verde, Chino Valley area, we have what's called speed reducing curves. So you don't just jump into the roundabout, that it kind of swings you off to the right, swings you off to the left, and then you're ready to enter. So those curves actually start reducing and get smaller and smaller as you approach. So you start feeling uncomfortable, you start to being kind of physically confined and getting that target 15, 20 mile per hour entry speed. Another piece that I think is important to note, it's very much in the nuance of engineering, but when we lay this out and design it and design to that speed of the vehicle, we use a fastest path analysis that we call it. So it actually takes into account a car changing lanes where they really shouldn't be, but cheating the curves basically. Like if I change lanes, I can go a little bit faster and make it smoother. That's actually the speed that we designed to. So that vehicle that's illegally jumping lanes basically is still going slow enough. So that's all the pieces we use to make sure that we get compliance from it. Thank you, and thank you for bringing up the, I forget what term you use, but the dual roundabouts that that does slow you down. I was in a town this summer that had that, and I recall thinking that to myself because now I pay attention to roundabouts all the time. Um, okay, so I, I want to hear more of the discussion with council, but I am, again, thankful that you brought Alternative D in, and any time that we can do anything to shorten the time it takes to get from point A to point B for a pedestrian, I would like to keep pushing that. And I'm not sure if, if we can achieve that, maybe we don't need the refuge islands. It's a thought. And the tunnel, I don't know if that is cost, if that would be something we could do. Always up for investigating that. And I'll leave it at that for now and see what my colleagues say. Vice Mayor? Um, I was gonna wait until after public comment to weigh in. All right, me as well. Um, but I just want to share thanks, and I've heard a lot of um, positive input from the public about the, the um, outreach that you did and the amount of, of public input that you took along this project, so thank you. Uh, first up, we have Adam Shimoni. Good evening, Mayor, Vice Mayor, members of the council, leadership, staff, members of the public. Adam Schmoney speaking today on behalf of Flagstaff Biking Organization, who put a lot of effort into this project. Um, I want to thank Jeremy, Nick, Mark, and the team for their work on this project and all the public outreach that was done. Uh, this corridor, as you know, doesn't have many um, pedestrians currently, but will in a number of years. And so it's extremely important that we build for all especially given that there's two schools right there and there's gonna be a lot of kids that are either gonna walk or if we don't do it right, they're gonna drive, which is gonna to add to why we build such large projects, right? So I attended much of the public outreach done and concerns were shared at most every meeting I attended that this was too big, too fast, too much for cars and they felt that they had to choose between three projects that in the chart that you saw, none of which put pedestrians first. I think the highest ranking was a three. Why wasn't any of those fives for pedestrians? You know, think about that for a minute. And it's because we still put cars first. But that being said, I think staff did do a good job at trying to accommodate pedestrians and our, their needs. Um, in the Flagstaff Biking Organization's letter that was sent to you all, concerns were raised around modeling and how modeling is done, such as NAH and how NAH might impact the modeling and how we just make all sorts of kind of guesses as to what the modeling might need to be, but yet we rely on the modeling to determine levels of service for these different projects, right? We're not considering a five lane protected intersection because of the modeling and how that results in levels of service for cars. But yet the modeling itself is a guesstimate, right? We have no idea really what's gonna end up being 20 years from now and the real need of JW Powell, et cetera. So really think about how these levels of services are playing into things through the modeling. Um, I'm gonna give a few comments on behalf of FBO. Um, in regards to 
Alternative D, I want to thank staff for that. I think that that is a decent option. I'm not fully on board with it, 100% jumping with joy, but I think it's a real honest um, attempt to do something better for the community and hearing what the public is saying. So raised crosswalks are needed. The median needs to be 12 feet, not 15 feet. Um, turn movements need to be sharp in the entrance points and around the roundabouts. Little details, right? But those details go a long way. Beacons need to let pedestrians get through with one push and not three pushes to get through one leg. And shadow markings are needed along the road for bikes and, and, and drivers to know that uh, these lanes are for bikers as well. Um, I appreciate you hearing my public comment and, and I'm here for any questions you might have. Thank you. Thank you. Will you repeat those um, bullet points that you just said? Thank you, Mayor. I, I would be glad to. So raised crosswalks go a long way in slowing down traffic. Median needs to have trees along with being a smaller width, not 15, 16 feet, but more like 12 feet. And it, let me ask you, what is the reasoning for that? Uh, distance traveled for pedestrians. Um, I'm not fully sure exactly how that impacts the intersection and the crossing for the pedestrian at that point. And if it doesn't have an impact, then I guess 15 feet is okay. But I just don't see the real value other than, and maybe this is a good question for staff, but if it lessens the distance a pedestrian needs to cross, that's a good thing, right? Uh, turn movements into the roundabouts and around the roundabouts is a small detail that Mark and the team with Nick and Jeremy talk a lot about and go a long way in, in slowing cars down as they enter into the roundabout and, and navigate it. And I think those types of details are important. Um, and if they, if they aren't voiced by us, then I think staff often will default to more of a car free flowing movement, which is a difference of a few miles an hour, which can be life and death. And then the beacons, if you look at the design, especially for the roundabouts, often, um, and, and staff hasn't necessarily gotten into this level of detail, I don't believe, but to cross one leg of this roundabout here on the bottom, you have to push a beacon three times as a pedestrian to cross. There's ways to set it up where you can push the beacon once and the pedestrian will have cars waiting for them and they can just cross. And I think that that goes a long way in putting the pedestrian first. And then share markings, if you don't know what those are, those are the bike lane markings on the, on the actual car lane that say share the lane with bikers and they have the bike symbol. And often what you see, FBO talks a lot about this, the board, that often if you have good separated infrastructure, cars expect you to utilize it. But there is a small percentage of riders who will want to take the lane. And they might act aggressively to cyclists in, in their vehicles if they feel like, hey, this is my lane, you have yours, use yours. But if there's shadow markings on the lane that say, hey, share the lane with cyclists, that driver will then hopefully relax and, and say, okay, this lane's for both of us to share, right? So those little details go a long way. And then the last thing that I actually forgot to mention is the speed limit. Like Jeremy mentioned, 35 miles an hour, which really means 40, maybe even plus for some of us, uh, results in, in fatality. 90% of the time. So why not bring it down to 30, right? Where then that really means 35. And that really makes a big difference in fatality rates. Um, so if they don't hear from you saying, hey, we want you to build to 30 and design for 30, they're gonna design for 35. And the last thing I'll say about that, Mayor, is that both your council and the previous council both said for Butler on the west side of town that we wanna see that lowered from 35 to 30. So why not have that be one unified speed limit east to west Butler, 30 miles an hour, and, and really just create a culture of slowing people down, which impacts them by a matter of seconds, um, but yet can save lives, right? And maybe make them a little bit more aware of their surroundings. Um, thank you. If anyone, anyone else has any questions, I am available, but I appreciate it. Councilmember Matthews, do you have a question? I do. Adam, um, is there any um, actual data that we could research about the 
share your lane with a bicycle, how much that reduces any accidents? Is there any information out there that can be researched? I'd have to look into that and I'm happy to do so. I wonder if Martin Ince, our city multimodal planner, might have something to say about that, um, given his expertise. But I can check with the team and check with people like Martin and, and send something to you and the rest of the council once I find something. Yeah, I'd be interested in that. And then just another plug overall, and I know it's on government speed, but JW Powell, because the traffic's getting more and more congested. And I know there's this dream out there that that'll just move people to other alternatives, but the reality is we have a lot of tourists, and so when we open up JW Powell Connection, that will help people from trying to race down the road because they're late, because you know they, they're stuck in traffic over on Milton and stuff. So I think this, in the overall big picture, um, I'm hoping that we are sooner than later on the JW Powell. So that's great. And if I had, can take a quick moment to make one last comment that I wasn't able to get to. Uh, distances matter in terms of crossing distances. At Lone Tree and Butler, the one that we all discussed for hours about, that's five lanes at 11 feet each, about 55, 56 feet more or less of crossing distance. The smallest distance here is 86 feet. That's a lot, right? And if you can think about a kid going from Canyon Del Rio to Sanawa Middle School, that's 170 feet of crossing distances versus at Lone Tree and Butler, it's maybe 110. So this isn't necessarily convenient for pedestrians or children, but uh, I do think staff is, is making an effort to try to meet the city code while also meeting the needs of our community. But I still have concerns about the distance. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Shimoni. Dapper Dre. Thank you, Mayor, Vice Mayor, Council Members, staff. Uh, also want to thank the presenters. Was at the presentation at the uh, Aquaplex. Uh, got a lot of good information, appreciate it. Uh, I would like to echo any kind of consideration for reducing of speed limits is, I think, a good thing across the board, especially on our thoroughfares. I know most of the time, a lot of the modeling is going for, again, cars, but that's always convenience and uh, anything to slow down either sightline or by design, which I think, uh, you know, I didn't know how I felt about roundabouts first off for a while, but then seeing uh, what it does to actually have to geometrically and physically slow down cars is an amazing thing. So if we can do that in any other kind of design, I think it's helpful for people who are trying to walk and trying to bike and being uh, ultra considerate of that. I'd also like to point out that most of the people that come and talk about this kind of thing are pedestrians and cyclists. Rarely do you have anybody uh, who's a staunch motorist who is coming in and asking you to raise speed limits and to make it faster for cars. Yes, people are asking for shorter commute times, understandable. You wanna be able to make it uh, to the places you wanna go as quickly as possible. But it's not pedestrians and cyclists that are often slowing down these uh, queue lines and stuff. It's vehicles. I mean, it's all the vehicles that we continue to plan for, that we continue to put at the first and foremost design pattern. Is there any chance at some point there's a strictly pedestrian thing that has some car features? And I'm not talking about the FUTs because that's not something that is maintenance during the winter or maintenance on a regular uh, place. It's always design, 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 huge amount for cars. Okay, let's like consider a little bit for pedestrians crossings. Let's consider a little bit of what we can give them for the sidewalk and the side travel lanes. Maybe one of these days we can consider like a specifically pedestrian and bike thoroughfare or boulevard or something that has maybe a little bit of a car feature. Because that's how we always feel. And pedestrians and cyclists are always put the burden to 
traverse and to figure out their commutes and to add time to the commutes. Make that for the convenience of the car. The car is a quality or climate controlled box that can sit in traffic, that can sit in places and be considerate, and yet it never is taken into consideration in that effect. Thank you. Thank you. Star Kelly Raymer. Mayor, Council, thank you very much for your time. And gentlemen, thank you for your time. I also was at the presentation at the Appleplex and as a result came to this presentation because I didn't quite understand all of the charts because none of the streets are labeled. You just have arrows. I want to know, well, I live in Continental. I've lived there for 15 years. Whenever there has been problems with trucks getting on to I-40, what they tend to do is come out of Little America, make a right, go to Continental Drive or Mount Pleasant and take those roads to Country Club and get on the, and get on the freeway there. I want to know what's going to keep trucks. You said they can only make a right-hand turn when they come. Well, what's going to keep them from then getting to Continental and making a left-hand turn and going and getting to the freeway? Or to Mount Pleasant. These are two residential streets. As it stands now, there are no crosswalks on either one of those. I cannot see how you're going to not have trucks using those roads. So I'd like to see that addressed, because it's not safe for the rest of us. We'll ask them when um, we have some additional questions, we'll ask them to address that. Thank you very much. I, too, am a proponent of safety, and I'm glad to see that you guys are considering safety. One of the things I did also notice, I'm sorry, this is one last comment, when you listed your um, partners that you're working with, Flagstaff Unified School District wasn't included. And I'm wondering, with all those schools there, why that was the case, since they also take care of our children. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to recommend that you apply for one of our city commissions. You think of really good questions. Thank you. Wilma Ener Eninger, D did I come close? No, Ugh. it's Dutch, Eninger. Thank you for being here tonight and just a second. Um, I live in Sanagua Heights. I appreciate and also attended the, he the hearing and had some tough questions for you guys and some, but I really appreciate the challenge that they are confronting because of prior bad decisions um, regarding this road. Um, I do have one comment I want to make real quick. I live in Sanagua Heights, but my project, my property bounds Butler, and I have not been consulted, and I may well be affected. If you look at the map, and I don't know if you can bring that back up, but the map shows the project going to right past my property, and no one has spoken to me. I think that's a problem. And regarding um, the project, Sanago Heights is not included. Anyone who drives Butler coming from Continental, coming from Fox Glen, coming from um, east or west knows that um, traffic bottles up at Sanago Heights during school periods when parents are dropping their kids off and picking them up. And in the 8 o'clock and rush hour times, we cannot really easily turn left out of Sanago Heights. In fact, it's, it's dangerous for us to turn. So it seems to me that it makes sense to include Sanagua Heights in the planning on this, particularly as, as people come out of 
this proposed roundabout, if that is approved, they're gonna go fast up that hill and there's a curve and there's a sort of a slingshot effect if you drive that road and cars just start speeding faster right there and it seems to me that that um, curve should be addressed in any plan to um, look at um, redesigning Butler. Um, I have other comments, let's see. So regarding the, so failure to include Sinagua Heights. And there's no crosswalk for us to get across the street. So if I, want to walk, if I want to walk my dog over at the middle school, I really am taking my life into my hands. There's no easy way to get across that street. And we have a lot of children now, as home ownership is turned over in Sinagua Heights, who go to the middle school, and they're crossing that road. And they're not gonna go down to the, the roundabout or down to the school and then come up the hill. What they're doing is crossing the hill and climbing the hill there. So that really needs to be addressed. Um, I'm really concerned about the roundabout from the perspective of pedestrian traffic. And the reason that so few of us walk on Butler right now is not that we'd rather drive, but that it's dangerous to drive there. And putting in a, a roundabout that I was trying to calculate how, how long it would take me to do it and how patient an eight-year-old would be waiting for traffic to go. I figured we're gonna have deaths there and, and I would much prefer the, the light fixture. Um, and I know that people say the roundabouts are safer, but uh, there are fewer fatalities, but there are more accidents and it seems to me that many of those accidents are serious. And may I have a few more minutes to finish as there are very few people here? Well, I had a question about um, when you were talking about Sanawa Heights and how fast people go there. Um, so I guess it's a question for, for both, and that is, um, are there future plans for doing some of these treatments um, up east on Butler to slow traffic down? Yes. Why not now? Sure. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, as part of this project, we have not fully determined what the exact limits will be. We do have some options, whether it would be medians or striping um, at their intersection. Uh, we have, again, we haven't gotten into design. Certainly we've heard some of these um, concerns, uh, so we will continue to work and evaluate those. Thank you. And um, Wilma, what were your additional concerns Thank about traffic much. on that street? Um, the, the proposal to put the median there in front of Little America, Mobile, and Black Barts is, I think, going to terribly affect those businesses and also me. So say that I go to Mobile and Gas Up and I want to go back east on Butler. I can't. So I should go through the intersection, go down to the frontage road, turn right there, go in front of Walmart, up to the 4th Street overpass, and back down to Butler. That makes no sense whatsoever. I believe that we're just going to have to um, suck it in, suck it up, and, and allow trucks to make right, and, and residents. See, I want to go to Little America for brunch. I can't. I can't make a left turn in there. What am I supposed to do? Cross through the light, make a U-turn in front of the Chevron, and then come back? We're adding all sorts of dangerous um, driving to what is already a messy situation. But I think if they were a light there and clear guidance for drivers as well, because I'm coming west on Butler, and a truck is out there wanting to make a left turn, and all the drivers are out there saying, no way, and, and, and making the truckers wait to make their turn until they've gone by. Well, we have to have some common sense as citizens as well, and have some um, respect for, um, the, um, for the business people, the truckers, who are trying to get back on the road. So I'm, and finally, my last comment is, I'm really concerned about, as I said, about the impact of those businesses, long-term businesses here in town. How, how do we go to Little America? How do we go to Mobile? Black Barts. Is the housing authority aware that one of the proposals would take land from Black Barts, and that would be the, the, um, the RV spaces that are on the outside for the roundabout? There are 12 of those spaces. They rent for 1000 a month. So that's a net annual loss to Black Barts of 144000 But more important, that is 12 affordable living spots here in Flagstaff. That building up there on the 4th uh, at, uh, next to the middle school, I call it the monstrosity on the hill, will in five to six years create how many spaces? 10, 12? 
but we're gonna lose what are really affordable housing spaces for, for not just low income, but middle income workers. I know someone who was living at Black Barks for two years who got $30 an hour, but couldn't find housing in Flagstaff. So um, the installation of the medians will be a mess for those of us who live there. And I think it's a bad, bad idea. It will hurt businesses. And um, um, I think that s other solutions need to be found. And the roundabout at Hell Ranch Road, as I said, affects the, uh, um, oh, and Harold Ranch Road people were at that hearing too, and they said, hey, we weren't consulted. Wait a minute. And as I said, I live right there, my property, right? My property is right there in that yellow line. Thank you. Nobody's talked to me. Um, that's a real problem. So I've got these written comments. Can I leave them for you and then? You can, you thank you. At your leisure? Yeah, thank, thank you. you. And thank you for the extra minutes, I appreciate it. <clears throat> okay, let's see, how do we want to, um, if you will come back, I want to ask you some of the questions that have been asked by our speakers and then take comments and questions from council members as well. Um, what about the business access and, um, and, and so we talked about the truck traffic coming out of um, Little America and I didn't realize that trucks went all the way up to Mount Pleasant or um, or Continental, was that the other? Yeah, or Continental, uh, and we're using those to get onto I-40. I mean, I was just thinking about my own, you know, it's essentially, if you're going to try to turn left out of there, it's kind of like closing your eyes and just punching it. Um, so, so can you talk a little bit more about that? I'll start with the business access. At this point, we have been coordinating. We have had conversations with Black Bart's Mobile and Little America about this. Uh, we didn't go into a ton of detail here, but so far what we're showing here is that we're maintaining left to have access into the business from any direction. You, the speaker was correct that you know, in the event if you were at Mobile and you wanted to leave and go east, there, the current configuration would not allow for a left out. And that's, that's largely the restriction here, right? Because left out is where you have to cross lanes and go merge in. It's the much more difficult and often more dangerous maneuver. It's the one with the trucks that's causing trouble. So in what we have here, we have maintained left ins both into Mobile, Little America, and Black Bart's. Wait, wait a minute. Oh, okay, so that so car, have, this, this that's is, a left well, in. This is Mobile. Okay. Mobile in, this is Little America in. We didn't really focus on this, but there's some adjustments to this truck. We're trying to shrink that truck driveway as much as possible because it's currently well over 200 feet wide. And then, of course, preserving the left in to Black Bart's. We have had conversations with Black Bart's about both this maintaining their existing entrance. Uh, the original plans were to actually have them take their entrance off of the, the roundabout. That were the historical plans. They're, they're not in support of that for some of the reasons that were mentioned. It would impact RV spots. So we, again, we haven't gotten into design, so we have not fully, we haven't evaluated what those impacts will be. Of course, you know, we commit to doing our best to minimize any of those impacts um, to taking any RV spaces and so on. But at this point, we haven't gotten there, so we have not fully evaluated what those impacts would be. So if you're coming out of mobile or coming out of Black Bart's, your, your only choice is a right turn out of both of those. And Little America, yes. Oh, okay. If you're, if you're coming, if you're exiting, right turns are your only options. So then if you wanted to then go east up Butler, you're making a U-turn somewhere. Right, or you're going down to Ponderosa and going up Huntington, or you're finding another route to loop back around. And the, the 
comment about um, black BART spots, is, um, is that part of this project, some of that property? We haven't gotten into design, so we haven't been able to fully evaluate whether there will be impacts to black BARTs. We've had the conversations, we hear their concerns, and our intent is to minimize any impacts. There are some grade changes there, there are some historical property issues there as far as what's currently right of way and what's not that we still have to work through. But that will largely be informed when we actually get into design because we, ha we have some flexibility as far as where that roundabout goes. And obviously it needs to serve all the users, uh, but we have committed to continue to working with Black Bart's and to minimizing those impacts. And I promise that I'm going to allow you to answer the first question that I asked you. Um, but what is, the, what is the reason, I think I can guess, but what's the reason for the first roundabout at Harold Ranch Road? The first roundabout is for that truck U-turn movement to allow them to get back. The large majority, the, the example that was given is when there is an issue on I-40 and, and trucks are trying to find an alternate detour route to cut off a couple of miles and so on. And I can't speak to any solutions about how that might be addressed right now. Uh, but the, the roundabout is largely driven by that need for trucks to be able to perform a safe U-turn maneuver to get back on the interstate, because that's where the vast majority of those trucks are. It's important to note that both Butler and 4th Street are truck routes. They are designated truck routes within the city. And residents of Harold Ranch Road will be able, of course, with the, the roundabout there, they'll be able to go left or right. Okay, and then, um, so you, you did just answer my first question about trucks, and, um, and it sounds like there needs to be some enforcement, because con do I understand correctly that Continental and Mount Pleasant are not truck routes? Butler East of 4th Street is not classified as a truck route. Okay, okay. Um, Council members, do you have other questions while I flip through my notes? Council member Matthews. Thank you, Mayor. Um, one of the speakers um, brought up about the school up there on um, Butler. I, I have the opportunity to drive Butler past there over to Continental and, and I, I see that issue and maybe we could kind of incorporate I know it's been a problem for a while. Maybe we could look at that to see if we're kind of making that improvement up that direction anyway, see the feasibility of maybe putting in a light or something because there are a lot of kiddos that um, are hanging out and getting out of school and trying to get home or wherever. Um, I, and I, too, am concerned about Black Bart's losing, um, you know, uh, spaces. Um, I know a great alternative for a lot of our residents is um, having a mobile home or a travel trailer and using that as their home uh, because of the cost of living. So um, hopefully we can um, find a way not to take away any of those spots. And then, um, but to the point of, of not being able to turn left um, on Butler I mean, that's hairy anyway. It might be a blessing to not turn left because I have came out of Little America to turn right to get back into town, and it is one of those close your eyes and punch it thing. And so maybe if we're forced to not have that option, it might save some fender benders or even lives. So um, I am not opposed to that at all. So I just want to make those three uh, points, and I, I am really concerned about Black Bart's losing any any spaces. Maybe they could go further down or whatever, but just keep that in your mind. Additional comments or questions? Vice Mayor? Yeah. I'll, <clears throat> I'll weigh in here. Uh, very good discussion. I appreciate the presentation. I appreciate the great questioning the comments that have been made already and the public participation both tonight and previously. Uh, I don't have a lot to say. I'm a big fan of Alternative D. 
Um, I'm also okay with the other roundabout option. I'm glad there's a better option uh, surfacing. Um, I think it's well known at this point that I, I'm, I'm your roundabout guy. I'm your go-to roundabout guy when you need a roundabout guy. Um, I, you know, I wonder with this uh, underground pedestrian feature tunnel, um, I understand what's going on there. That that whole area is going to get raised to a higher grade level. So putting in a tunnel wouldn't be that difficult and would be a lot less expensive than say what we're doing uh, near Target and Milton. I wonder if it would be feasible to even look into a uh, cross uh, way there so that you're able to come into and out of all four of those intersection spots. Just something to think about and price out maybe. Uh, I, I, I think if we're gonna invest in that tunnel, it might not be that much more of an investment to make sure there's access in all four areas. Um, maybe I'm wrong there because I, I don't know about some other drainage features or other problems, but uh, let me know what you find out there. And I'll just wrap up by saying I just, uh, I'm really grateful and uh, just very heartened by the shift in this conversation over the six years that I've been on council. It's really nice to see that I don't, personally I don't feel like I'm swimming uphill anymore, upstream, um, talking about right sizing our roads and getting more features for pedestrians and multimodal efforts and active transportation uh, into our existing system. Um, this is a conversation that has really taken a turn towards uh, pedestrians and uh, cyclists uh, over the last couple of years. I'd like to give uh, Council Member Shimoni uh, uh, much of the credit for that, just for being so persistent um, and persuasive. Uh, and uh, I'd like to give myself some credit for that too. I think I've been a good uh, stalwart partner in these ideas and concepts, and it's just really nice that we're, there seems to be a lot of synergy in this room, and there seems to be a lot of like-mindedness in terms of what the objective should be, which is to get everybody moving better, and uh, it's just really nice uh, to be up here having this conversation without feeling like I'm putting on armor and uh, getting ready for a fight. Uh, it's, it's, it's really, really heartening. So thank you to everyone on council for that. And thank you to staff as well. I think you've been very responsive uh, to council's um, slow but steady sort of shift in how we're thinking about this as a community. Council Member Sweet. Thank you. Have a few thoughts to share. Um, I do like what Mr. Shimoni said about building for now, but also in the future. And I think we are doing that. And again, I appreciate where we've started when I got on council to now it is a huge difference. Um, I agree with the raised crosswalks, doing the median at 12 feet, making the turn movements, which you already did talk about sharp to slow people down the beacons to only have to push once, um, markings to remind the drivers that they are sharing the road with bicyclists. I now do share the road or sh share the lane as I go in, which is crazy to say, but I do it. Um, and I think that, you know, while we're having this conversation, we can bring in the crossing issues at Sanagua Middle School and maybe make that kind of a and add on to this project because I too, my son went there, I've, I've driven past and, and watched a lot of near misses and I think it would be a good time to kind of wrap that into this conversation. Thank you. Well, great comments and conversation, council. Um, uh, <sighs> council member Sweet. I'm so sorry, I do have one more. I think uh, communicating with the businesses like Little America and Black Barts, if you can really focus in on that, I'm hearing that maybe they're not getting enough communication and you've done so great with everything and I think they need to be part of it, so thank you. 
Are you finished? I am officially done. Okay, thank you. Um, I agree. This is this is a um, long way from where we were even when I started on council, and I'm appreciative of it. It does feel more cooperative, and um, and staff. I see that you get that we are very concerned about about helping people walk and bike if they want to do that as an alternative to driving or if that is their only mode of transportation. So what I would say when, when you move into design, if you could just think of pedestrians first with every decision and ask how does this impact pedestrians, um, then the design for cyclists will come along with that. And I think, too, when, I mean, we can all envision a future where we have more mixed modes of transportation and it's not so reliant on automobiles. And, and that is not to say that everyone's going to get out of their car. No one has that um, expectation. But we can allow traffic to flow and we can make it enjoyable for pedestrians and cyclists to use those roads in that way as well. Um, in counts, uh, <laughs> Mr. Shimoni um, mentioned that council has a couple of times asked about lower speed limits along the entire length of Butler. And I really want to see that happen. I want a conversation about what that looks like if we lower the speed limit on Butler. I would like to see a lower speed limit on this portion of the project. I think that it will make a, a huge difference to cyclists and pedestrians and a minuscule difference to automobiles. So hear that and Please, let's have that conversation. Um, I will echo and support everything that the um, Flagstaff Biking Organization brought up. I think that those are some excellent ideas, so please keep those in mind when you are um, going to design phase. And let's keep up the, the um, communication and make sure that as we're moving into the design phase that, that the, the people who we've heard from who felt like they weren't consulted or, or told, I think that you've done an outstanding job of community outreach, but hearing that there are people who um, weren't consulted Let's take that into consideration and make sure that we are communicating with those um, entities and um, echo the FUSD, the um, anything that we can do to make that Butler is just such a long road with so few opportunities to cross that anything we can do to make it convenient and, and uh, safer for students and teachers and whoever else is trying to access Sanawa is a good thing. Box Glen, everyone. Do you feel like you have um, the direction that you need? I think we do. Obviously, many, many more details that we will have to dive into and hammer out. Um, and it will be a process. And we'll keep people apprised of that process and continue to engage. We continue to encourage the public or anyone along that corridor to reach out. They have, they have all my contact information at this point. So if there's a specific concern, please reach out to me. Anyone on council, anything that you want to talk about, please keep us in the loop and we'll continue to move forward. I think I'm hearing that Alternative D is pretty strongly supported at this point, so we will proceed with that. I think we asked, we got some feedback on some of those sub-bullets. There's, there's some nuance there. I'll, I'm sure we'll revisit those when we dive into design. And I think we'll continue evaluating at least 
at the feasibility level, what that grade separated crossing would look like. There are a few challenges there. Some of those involve the grades. We, we need to be able to get people at street level down to those in an accessible manner. They have to be accessible facilities. Um, we can get them there, but they may have to loop down to Butler because coming down 4th Street can be is steep. So there's some considerations. We'll continue to do the work and we'll be back, like I said, we'll be back at some point around 30% design sometime this winter to continue that contract modification, the CMAR process, and we look forward to that future engagement. Thank you. And I would say in terms of communication with us, the more the better. Don't be afraid to come to us a lot. We'd like to hear from you and give you input. Yep. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much.